Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources, originally the home of the Natchez, the Homer, and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish, the police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst of transforming the former British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance and its continuing impact today. Two centuries ago, in this very place, the Cabildo, overlooking Jackson Square, one of the world's most significant real estate transactions occurred. It was a balmy spring-like day on Tuesday, December 20, 183, when representatives of the French and American republics completed the final transaction of Louisiana Purchase. In the ceremony observed by many of the great and small of New Orleans, Commissioner Pierre C. Losat transferred France's control and interest in Louisiana to Commissioners William C. C. Claiborne and General James Wilkinson of the United States. Literally and figuratively, with the stroke of a pen, the United States had practically doubled its size. For many who lived here, but also for many who would never see New Orleans, this single transaction would change the United States forever. The Louisiana Purchase Territory would give to the former British colonists the diversity and uniqueness that would later characterize the United States. Few who witnessed this scene could imagine the future enormity and significance of this event. Hello. Welcome to the Special Topics course on the Louisiana Purchase. My name is Raphael Casimir, Jr. So Rafael D. Lider, Professor of History at the University of New Orleans. I will be coordinating the course. First, I want to tell you how this course came into being. As you know, 2003 marked the bicentennial of the Louisiana Purchase. By the year 2000, the various states and communities which were once a part of the Purchase Territory began commemorative planning for this grand event. Dr. Connie Z. Atkinson, Associate Director of UNO's Ethel and Herman Mitlow Center for New Orleans Studies, suggested that UNO should do what it does best, teach. Thus, instead of providing one week or two of festive activities, we decided to offer a semester-long course on Louisiana Purchase. We also decided to draw upon our varied and several strengths. Instead of one person teaching the whole course, we decided to be interdisciplinary, with each lecturer drawing from his or her area of expertise. Additionally, we were fortunate enough to draw upon the facilities and resources of the staff of our Earl K. Long Library. While the course would be offered for credit, the general public would be invited to attend the lectures. The result, we believe, is an exciting and informative course. On the personal level, it has been a labor of love because my roots lay deep in the Purchase area. My family has been in Louisiana since the end of the 18th century, and I'm a sixth generation New Orleanian. My mother's maternal grandfather is a direct descendant of a free man of color who migrated to Louisiana from Guadalupe in 1793. On the other hand, my maternal great-grandmother was a Missouri-born slave sold to New Orleans just before the outbreak of the Civil War. I promise you that this course, taught by a team of dynamic scholar teachers, will be both scholarly and memorable. Over and over again, you hear the words unique, diverse, exotic. This semester, we will discuss the origin of Louisiana before it was called Louisiana, its uniqueness and vastness which made it an exotic and attractive place for people who came from the different corners of the globe. Here, people live, cook, dress, and dance somewhat differently from other people in other places. There has been a greater blending and amalgamation of different cultures here than practically anywhere else. Here, we celebrate and enjoy life, and death, too. We are world famous for our cities of the dead, a tradition we inherited from our Indian, African, and European forebears. We love to party and to eat, but we have our serious moments too. Indeed, we've been home to outstanding scholars, statesmen, as well as athletes and entertainers. Our music run the gamut from opera and symphony to zydeco, country and western, and of course, jazz, the Louisiana's gift for the modern world. Which state can simultaneously boast of Huey Long, Edward, Edwin, Edward Livingston, Louis Armstrong, Marie Laveau, 
Evangeline, with Harriet Jackson, John Lafitte. Sometimes we dress up to go nowhere because it put us in the festive mood. Joie de vivre is more than the French expression. It is also a way of life for those of us who have taught the rest of the world the joy of living. Sometimes our neighbors from east and west don't quite know what to make of us, suggesting that we are so different, very atypical from the rest of Americans. And so we are. But in many ways, we are just like them. Indeed, they are in so many ways a part of us. After all, the very first Louisiana settlement was located off the coast of Texas. And the first permanent French Louisiana settlement is now part of coastal Mississippi and Alabama. So for the next 13 weeks, get ready for some serious and exciting learning. I expect that you have so much fun learning that you may forget that you engage in a scholarly endeavor. And when you're having fun, time goes by so quickly. I hope you enjoy this experience as much as we did in putting it together for you. Bon voyage. To create the appropriate mood for our inaugural session, we invited all of our lecturers to participate in the roundtable discussion to provide us with synopses of their presentations. This collegial interaction provides a glimpse of the upcoming lectures. You will see from the spirited and energetic discussions how excited the lecturers are about the series. The roundtable is preceded by the first lecture on the purchase, especially that of the role of President Thomas Jefferson in this monumental transaction. The lecturer is Professor John Kukla, Vice President and Executive Director of the Patrick Henry Foundation. Kukla is a very respected scholar on early American history, especially Virginia. He was once our neighbor, having previously served as Executive Director of the Historic New Orleans Collection. His most recent of many publications is A Wilderness So Immense, The Louisiana Purchase and the Destiny of America. In his lecture, Kukla not only provides us insights into the purchase and the immediate benefits it provided, but also the problems it created, especially for Native Americans and African Americans, both free and unfree. Dr. Kukla relates how some of those same problems continue to trouble us today. On Saturday, May 11th, 1804, the mayor of New York City, DeWitt Clinton, staged a grand celebration of the first anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. At dawn, cannon on the battery at the foot of Manhattan and in the fort on the uh, nearby Governor's Island thundered a grand national salute. American flags were hoisted over the principal buildings of the city and hoisted by all the ships in the harbor. Church bells pealed triumphantly. A procession gathered in City Hall Park, rank upon rank of cavalry, infantry, and artillery. The mayor the sheriff and city officials marched through the streets of Manhattan, all led by the commander of the city's militia on a profusely decorated white horse carrying a very long, very long white silk banner on which were inscribed the words, extension of the empire of freedom and in the peaceful, honorable, and glorious acquisition of the immense and fertile region of Louisiana, December 30th, 1803, 28th year of American independence and in the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Behind the soldiers and politicians came the members of New York's Tammany Society, carrying a 15-foot long white muslin map of the Mississippi River and the surrounding 900,000 square miles of Louisiana. As the procession marched through lower Manhattan, cannons roared and bands played rousing music, including Hail to Columbia and Bonaparte's march, and the parade turned back up Broadway to City Hall Square, where the soldiers fired crisp salutes, and the assembled populace gave three resounding cheers for Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase. The next day, Sunday, May 12, 1804, 700 miles to the south, at St. Michael's Church in Charleston, South Carolina, Dr. David Ramsey, probably the most able historian of the nation's founding generation, delivered an oration on the cession of Louisiana to the United States. Ramsey was one of dozens of orators in cities up and down the uh, eastern seaboard, raising his voice in a veritable jubilee of oratory in the spring of 1804 to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana is ours, David Ramsey proclaimed, as to the significance of America's acquisition of that vast territory. Ramsey acknowledged 
the establishment of independence and of our present Constitution as being prior, both in time and importance. But with these two exceptions, Ramsey believed, the acquisition of Louisiana is the greatest political blessing ever conferred on these states. Historical perspective had not changed much 149 years later when Bernard DeVoto, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and easy chair columnist for Harper's Magazine, wrote about the Louisiana Purchase upon the occasion of the Susquecentennial in 1953. Because he lived after the Civil War, after Fort Sumter, and after Appomattox, DeVoto added one event to the comparative list, but otherwise his opinion about the importance of the Louisiana Purchase echoed Ramsey's. No event in American history, not the Civil War, nor the Declaration of Independence, nor even the signing of the Constitution was more important. DeVoto came close to proving his point in an essay commissioned by Collier's Magazine. He wrote about Western expansion, he wrote about exploration and commerce, and he wrote about constitutional change and the Civil War. But DeVoto knew that something was missing. However it may be put, he lamented, this peaceful transfer of sovereignty over some 900,000 square miles from Spain to France to the United States was a story that he said was still too momentous to be understood. We Americans live our lives in the wake of the Louisiana Purchase. It reshaped our hemisphere so completely that we cannot easily imagine anything different. It spurred exploration and expansion. Lewis and Clark tracked the northern reaches of the vast territory in 1804 and 1806 and staked a claim to the Pacific Northwest. Others headed south and west in other expeditions. Their odysseys inspiring artists from George Caleb Bingham and George Catlin to Thomas Hart Benton, Ansel Adams, and Georgia O'Keeffe. A nation that once may have been resigned to sharing the Mississippi with foreign neighbors now embraced the entire continent as its manifest destiny. But Bernard DeVoto knew all this in 1953 when he said the event was still too momentous to be understood. He knew that the Louisiana Purchase brought geographic expansion, discovery, and exploration, that it brought sectional and constitutional conflicts that led to the Civil War, and he sensed that something was missing. Today, as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase, I want to suggest that David Ramsey and Bernard DeVoto were too close to their subject, too close in time. Even as late as 1953, 150 years after the event, some of the long-term consequences of the Louisiana Purchase simply were not yet apparent. Today, I suggest we have a better vantage point simply because we and our children have lived longer with the results of the Louisiana Purchase. Perhaps the significance of this momentous event becomes clearer as its 200th anniversary converges with the 400th anniversaries of Jamestown Island and Plymouth Rock. In the aftermath of the tragedy of September 11th, we've heard a lot of talk about how our world has changed. Consider for a moment how different the country was for our parents and grandparents in 1953. In 1953, eight of 10 Americans lived on a farm or in a small town. Today, eight of 10 live in urban areas. In 1953, French soldiers were losing a war in Vietnam. Joseph Stalin was in the final year of his life, and Joseph McCarthy in the final year of his credibility. The Korean War was ending. Fidel Castro was an obscure prisoner in a Cuban jail. Neither the Berlin Wall nor the Watergate Hotel had even been built. Color television was experimental, and only 29% of American women worked outside the home compared with 57% today. Spanish was a foreign language. Segregation ruled the American South. Brown versus Topeka was in the lower courts. The Sauk vaccine was in field tests and the pill was in your dreams. In short, we have a vantage point today denied to David Ramsey in 1804 and to Bernard DeVoto in 1953. In the two centuries of Anglo-American colonial history, from Jamestown to the Louisiana Purchase, American public life had become the domain of Protestant, agrarian, English-speaking men. Whites were free, 
blacks were slaves, and Native Americans didn't count. Starting at New Orleans in 1803, five million Americans along the Atlantic seaboard began an encounter with diversity, with urban Catholics, Creoles, French, Spanish, Africans, West Indians, and Native Americans, an encounter with diversity that has been sustained by geographic expansion and immigration throughout the past two centuries. Ramsey and Devoto couldn't yet see it, but the Louisiana Purchase was a turning point at our national halfway mark toward an inclusive national history. Looking back from the year 2003, we should marvel at who we have become, the very antithesis of John Winthrop's Boston City on a Hill or of Thomas Jefferson's Yeoman Republic, and we may wonder what the next two centuries have in store. Despite some misgivings about the constitutional issues, most Americans agreed that the Louisiana Purchase was, in Talleyrand's words, a noble bargain, la bonne affaire. The Mississippi and its western tributaries alone drain a million square miles. The price of securing the control of the Ohio-Mississippi waterway and of doubling the size of the United States was 80 million francs, or $15 million, financed for 20 years by English and Dutch bankers. International negotiations completed in 1819 refi refined the boundaries between American and Spanish territories and also transferred Florida to the United States. Still, $15 million was a lot of money at the beginning of the 19th century, especially to strict constructionist Jeffersonians who were paying off the national debt that Alexander Hamilton had created to strengthen the central government. Some people have expressed fears lest our government may have given too much for Louisiana. An anonymous writer called himself subscriber told the editors of the Trenton, New Jersey, True American, I would wish to inform your readers that a company of moneyed men in this and the neighboring states is forming, he says, for the purpose of purchasing Louisiana from our government for the purchase money and the expense of the negotiation. Had it happened, they would have made a killing. When the 6% loans were repaid, the total cost of the Mississippi navigation and the whole of the Louisiana Territory was $23,527,872.57, about four cents an acre. In ceremonies here in the Sala Capitular, the Cabildo, now a part of the Louisiana State Museum, in New Orleans on November 30th, 1803, the last two governors of Spanish Louisiana, Manuel Juan de Salcido and his predecessor, the Marquez Sebastian Nicolas de Casacalvo, surrendered Louisiana to Napoleon's resident colonial prefect, Pierre Clement Losat. Three weeks later, again, here in the Casa Capitular, now owned by the Louisiana State Museum, Losat conveyed the city and colony to President Jefferson's commissioners, the civilian, William Charles Cole Claiborne, who would later become governor of Louisiana, and General James Wilkinson, whose troops stood ready if needed. After the second round of transfer ceremonies at the Cabildo on December 20th, 1803, American troops joined the local militia to raise the stars and stripes over the Place d'Armes now Jackson Square, just outside here. By day's end, Wilkinson met privately with Casa Calvo and the visiting governor of West Florida, Don Vincente Folch, to protest that his secret Spanish pension was $20,000 in arrears. Far more noteworthy than this holdover from the so-called Spanish conspiracy that might have separated Kentucky from the Union at the end of the Confederation period after the American uh, Revolution were the reactions of the American commissioners to the local militia who were out in the Place d'Armes helping to raise the American flag. When William C. C. Claiborne's namesake had landed at Jamestown in 1616, English colonists regarded the lands they took in North America, as they had taken lands in Ulster a few decades earlier, as a wilderness peopled only with savages, remnants of Native American tribes decimated by European disease. This outlook was already two centuries old in 1803, but Louisiana was different and threatening. New Orleans was not a wilderness, it was a city. 
and of its 8,000 permanent residents, 90% per comprise the elements of the three caste society of colonial Latin America and the Caribbean, about 3,300 French-speaking Creoles, about 2,800 slaves, and about 1,300 free people of color. The remainder of the population were refugees from San Domingue, Spanish officials and troops, and Anglo-Americans. On any given day, the city also plays host to a few hundred transient mercantile agents, river boatmen, barge hands, sailors, and naval officers. In the streets and markets of New Orleans, amid a gabble of tongues and an array of complexions, ivory, cafe au lait, copper, and ebony, a nation that habitually and legally regarded people either as black or white began its encounter with ethnic and cultural diversity born of expansion and immigration. The president's designated governor, William C. C. Claiborne, was a young transplanted Virginian who had single-handedly held the Tennessee vote for Jefferson against Aaron Burr in the contested election of 1800. Ruling New Orleans and Louisiana subject only to instructions from Jefferson and Congress, Claiborne held nearly dictatorial powers over the territory and its populace, people whose language he could not speak and whose society he did not comprehend. Long accustomed to their own East Coast world of white citizens and black slaves, Claiborne and the 12,000 Jeffersonian Americans who flooded into Louisiana in the decade after 1803 almost overwhelmed New Orleans' baffling patterns of race and language and law and culture. Jefferson and his countrymen had always assumed that the aliens would be displaced, assimilated, or marginalized by English-speaking settlers. And they might have been, except for the aftermath of the Haitian and the French revolutions. Between May 1809 and January 1810, New Orleans welcomed 10,000 French-speaking refugees from Saint-Domingue by way of Cuba, equal numbers of whites, slaves, and free people of color whose arrival made the city even more Caribbean, reinforcing everything that Claiborne and his countrymen found exotic and dangerous about New Orleans for decades to come. Of the many differences between the Anglo-American nation and its new polyglot territory, the contrast between the Spanish three-caste society and the East Coast black-white slave-free dichotomy was perhaps the most striking. The plight of the colony's free people of color, who had no significant counterparts in Anglo-American East Coast society, illustrates the larger situation. And the most alarming examples to the Americans were military units composed of and led by free people of color, armed free people of color. Condescending tolerance of cultural and ethnic difference is one thing. New Orleans cuisine was and is delicious, the music agreeable, the people handsome. But these were militia units, a serious assertion of political, military, and social authority by the city's free people of color. What was the new American regime to do? What was the new American regime to do? After Claiborne and Wilkinson signed the transfer papers here in the Cabildo on December 20th, 1803, they walked to the balcony overlooking the Place d'Armes on its flagpole in the heart of the city, and it would be difficult to exaggerate their shock at the sight of free colored militiamen helping to raise the stars and stripes over New Orleans. The shock comes through in their letters. The formidable aspect of the armed blacks and mulattoes officered and organized is painful and perplexing, Wilkinson wrote in an urgent dispatch that he sent to Washington asking the War Department to send more troops. Claiborne was relieved that the colored militiamen had, as he put it, universally mounted the eagle in their hats and were no longer sporting the tricolored cockade of the French Revolution. But these patriotic trappings did not lessen the new American governor's dilemma, for he knew his actions were being watched closely in Louisiana and throughout the country. Claiborne described his options in a letter to the State Department. If he granted new commissions for the colored militia companies, as he put it, it might be considered as an outrage to the feelings of a part of the nation, that is, to slaveholders worried about upholding what he called, in a euphemism for slavery, principles of policy which the safety of the southern states has necessarily established. 
On the other hand, Claiborne lamented, not to be recommissioned would disgust them. It would disgust the leaders of the free people of color militia units. And it would create, as he put it, an armed enemy in the very heart of the country. Claiborne accurately characterized this confrontation with diversity as the principal difficulty that he faced as governor of the new territory. And once again, the events of the Louisiana Purchase were shaped by events and attitudes from the world at large. The people of color are all armed, Wilkinson wrote, and it is my opinion that a single envious, artful, bold, incendiary, in short, a man like Toussaint Louverture, might produce those horrible scenes of bloodshed and violence which have been so frequently noticed in Saint-Domingue. While Americans and French-speaking whites demanded the suppression and even the banishment of the colored militia officers, the free people of color petitioned Governor Claiborne for assurances of their own personal and political freedom, according to Article Three of the 1803 Treaty of the Louisiana Purchase Session. Article Three promised the inhabitants of Louisiana all rights, advantages, and immunities of citizens of the United States. Here in a microcosm, the United States faced the human consequences of the Louisiana Purchase for the first time. And President Jefferson's response was telling. Claiborne was instructed to buy time, confirm the colored militia in their posts, and treat them favorably till a better settled state of things shall permit us to let them neglect themselves. As a compromise under a cover of reorganizing the entire territorial militia, Claiborne put white officers in command of the free men of color, all the while dreading, as he put in it in his letters, that in time this quarter of the Union must, I fear, experience in some degree the misfortune of Saint-Domingue. The compromise handling of the militia satisfied no one. Within weeks, a free black named Stephen betrayed a plot among the city's people of color slaves and free, now a numerical majority of the population. The plan, it was said, involved a revolt to free the slaves and overthrow American rule, and a Spanish invasion force from Florida led by former Governor Casa Calvo, the same Casa Calvo who was paying Wilkinson's secret pension. While I was researching and writing my book about the Louisiana Purchase, other scholars were making other discoveries that made this story and its context more interesting and more controversial. Now, as we think about the president of those United States and, and of his evasion of the reality of New Orleans's free people of color, another microcosm leaps to our mind because scholars have been grappling with the implications of the DNA findings that confirm the long suspected liaison between Thomas Jefferson and his sa slave, Sally Hemings. As we think about the implications of race and the Louisiana Purchase, this obvious parallel leaps to mind. Thomas Jefferson lived on a plantation community at Monticello of some 200 people on the top of his mountain. He walked daily among faces that exhibited a whole range of tones, even with his own, within his own family. But Jefferson saw only white and black, free and slave. Here in Louisiana, his representatives and his countrymen tried to do the same thing in their 1803 encounter with the racial diversity of Louisiana. Controversies over race, religion, law, language, and culture not only delayed Louisiana's statehood until 1812, they worked like the rumblings of an earthquake along the vulnerable fault lines of 19th century American society and government. By 1818, 1819, when treaties among the United States, Spain, and Great Britain gave America the rest of the Floridas and drew the final boundaries of the Louisiana Purchase, the second half of our national history was well underway. The land north of 33 degrees was now called the Missouri Territory to avoid confusion with the state of Louisiana south of 33 degrees. Millions of acres of cheap, fresh lands drained by the Mississippi and its tributaries were ideal for cotton, a commodity with a lucrative new market in the steam-driven mills of Manchester, England, a fiber now readily processed by Eli Whitney's cotton, cotton gin, and a crop 
all too well suited to plantation agriculture and the extension of slave labor into the territories of the Louisiana Purchase. As Americans brought their internal improvements and their slaves to New Orleans and the New Territory, the nation's long deferred debate over slavery grew increasingly angry. The consequences of the Louisiana Purchase scoured at the mortar of the Constitution. New Englanders who had argued for states' rights and secession in reaction to the Louisiana Purchase allowed their arguments to go south. In 1820, when the Missouri crisis erupted over the creation of another slave state from the territory of the Louisiana Purchase, a grand compromise was necessary to preserve the Union. Henceforth, the new states were admitted in pairs, one slave and one free, to keep a balance of power in the United States Senate. This Missouri compromise worked until the 1850s, but the Missouri question, as what I'd rather see called the Louisiana question, had come to be known to avoid confusion, haunted the conscience of America until the cannon roared at Fort Sumter and long beyond. Travelers who actually visited New Orleans two centuries ago probably came closest to seeing the human significance of the Louisiana Purchase. The architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe, for example, arrived in 1819 to what he described as a more incessant, loud, rapid, and various gabble of tongues than was ever heard at Babel. He found the three-caste society of New Orleans wholly new even to one who has traveled much in Europe and America. It was a bustling urban place filled with Catholics, Creoles, French, Spanish, Africans, Native Americans, West Indians, and Anglo-Americans, a place with Irish and Germans and countless other groups soon to arrive. Here at the Cabildo in New Orleans on December 20th, 1803, the United States began a long encounter with diversity that has forced us and that should inspire us to think and to live far differently than the founders expected. At the beginning of my remarks, I quoted the perspectives of two notable historians who wrote about the Louisiana Purchase on the occasions of its first and of its 150th anniversary. In closing, may I introduce the commentary of a third historian, written, as he put it, at the dawning of the 20th century and published in February 1903, coincidental to the 100th anniversary. The problem of the 20th century, wrote W.E.B. Du Bois, as Jim Crow was tightening its cruel grip on America, is the problem of the color line, of the two worlds within and without the veil. We stand at the dawning of the 21st century in a new millennium and the celebration of the bicentennial of the Louisiana Purchase. Although Ramsey and Du Bois and Devoto did not live to see it, did not have the imagination to envisage it, we stand at a moment when census officials report that the Spanish-speaking population of America has become the nation's largest minority group. Isn't it finally time for Americans to look beyond the old East Coast dichotomy of black and white, beyond the barrier of any single line. I'm reminded of a conversation I had a few years ago with a black gas station attendant on Rampart Street. It was February and I was wearing a purple, green, and gold bow tie and he was wearing a polo shirt of the same color. He complimented my tie, I complimented his shirt. And then he shook his head in disgust over the divisive Mardi Gras ordinance controversy that was then raging in City Hall. Extreme people, he said. They need to leave us alone and let us all have fun together. Without ever forgetting that Louisiana has witnessed ugly and vicious moments of racial discord and, dis and bloodshed, I want to hope that perhaps standing at the beginning of a millennium and in the midst of a bicentennial, Perhaps at last we can learn a lesson from the good people of this remarkable city, a city that Walker Percy praised for its minor virtues. With help from the good people of New Orleans, perhaps we Americans can begin to look back at the Louisiana Purchase as the midpoint in a long and slow and often tragic story of eventual inclusion. If a candid reconsideration of the Louisiana Purchase helps us see diversity rather than dichotomy at home, 
and if the fascinating and complex international story of the Louisiana Purchase helps us remember that our history is inextricably tied to the actions of other nations abroad, perhaps we may yet be able to paraphrase David Ramsey and say that the acquisition of Louisiana is the greatest blessing ever conferred on these states. Admittedly, both for David Ramsey two centuries ago and for me today, this kind of rhetoric may more accurately represent the hopes of a fellow citizen rather than the sober judgments of a historian. But one thing is certain, the most fascinating part of the story of the Louisiana Purchase, the destiny that we choose to make for America, remains further downstream. We're in the famous room where the transfer of Louisiana from French to American control took place about 200 years ago. And as you know, two of the principals were Jefferson, the American president, Napoleon, who was first consul of France. Do you think maybe Napoleon or Jefferson get too much credit for the transfer? Well, I think uh, in a way that uh, Jeff Jefferson perhaps does get uh, a little bit too much credit. Uh, he was very lucky, after all, that uh, the deal broke the way that it did. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, you do have to give him credit for playing his cards well uh, once this uh, deal was in the prospect. But um, uh, he was very, very fortunate. I think it sort of fell into his lap. I think we have to give Jefferson credit in, in one other aspect as well. He had the virtue of not being paralyzed by his principles. <laughs> uh, he uh, was a strict constructionist who exercised powers that were nowhere listed in the Constitution. Man who hated cities, who acquired New Orleans. Man who uh, had been pro-French most of his life and recognized a national security threat to the United States when Napoleon uh, took over the Louisiana Territory once again. So he was uh, able to take advantage of the deal that fell into his lap because he was able to see the relationships that existed and was able to overcome his reticence uh, in making the deal. What about Napoleon's role in this? Do you think perhaps he was given too much credit for the transfer? I think uh, the events that took place on the island of saint Domingue aided Napoleon uh, from the standpoint that he was no longer able uh, to continue his uh, expansive plans for an empire in North America. Once that revolution was successful, uh, he was uh, no longer able to hold on to the island of St. Germain. So he's a realist, you'd say? Yes. Well, he was very fortunate uh, in getting the $15 million uh, at the time, which he was able to put to use uh, to uh, prosecute wars uh, in Europe. And uh, since uh, he no longer uh, had uh, his possession in Saint-Domingue, uh, this was, uh, Louisiana was ripe for the picking uh, by the English uh, without uh, Napoleon getting any money for it at all. They were not in a position to defend uh, Louisiana. I would assert, I don't know if it's true or not, that Napoleon actually used the money that he got from the purchase to buy surreptitiously overcoats from England to fight England, because remember, he had this continental decree, and you were not supposed to trade with the English or their allies, and he got some go between to buy British overcoats because they made the best overcoats. Uh, all of that was done under the counter uh, of the, uh, un in several ways. Uh, it was impossible under the continental systems uh, ground rules uh, for French merchants uh, in Bordeaux uh, to peddle wine and liqueurs uh, to England. and. Uh, they were furious, they're well uh, connected, and uh, it was arranged ultimately, uh, it amounted to a kind of barter in which uh, the uh, English received uh, wine and liqueurs, uh, the French uh, received uh, uh, quinine, uh, among uh, other items, uh, and also uh, cloth, and it is true that uh, a lot of the cloth, for example, even worn by French troops uh, going into Russia was made uh, originally in England. But well, what about uh, Charles IV, the King of Spain, who had signed his treaty with Napoleon? Under no circumstances would he transfer Louisiana to a third party, 
if he decided he wanted to keep it. Yet, Poy violated the term. Was he consistent? When the Poy was probably consistent, and it, and it probably speaks to the diminishing uh, power of Spain, uh, that uh, the Poy felt free to act irrespective of the wishes of, of Spain. And if we look at uh, uh, Jefferson for a little while, Americans, as a rule, are forward-looking. And a lot of the credit Jefferson has gotten for the purchase is related for the Lewis and Clark expedition that, that followed, as well as the uh, settlement of the Louisiana area. So people kind of put several things together when they give them a lot of credit you know, for the purchase, because they did do a lot. And I think in a kind of abstract sense, it did uh, continue the kind of westward uh, forward movement of the United States population. Jefferson has his reputation as being the champion of the small so-called yeoman foreman. Does that deserve it? And didn't, in fact, the acquisition of Louisiana actually enhance the planted class more than the small yeoman farmers? Well, I don't think, I don't think that Jefferson ever had much truck with yeoman farmers to begin with, but I think uh, his sense of farmers being God's chosen lot were people like himself who were great planters. And, he, and uh, his idea of, of, plant, of farmers were Washington, Madison, folks of that sort with whom he had, he had grown up and grown accustomed to. Um, that group of great Virginia planters had a sense of themselves where they didn't, in some ways, truck with uh, people who were not of their not of their background, not of their type. And uh, uh, so, as I say, I don't I don't think that that's probably a good reading of that phrase. And there's another aspect of the class issue here. Uh, a number of the framers of the Constitution understood that if you were going to have a democratic republic, you couldn't have an impoverished mass of population, that people needed to have a stake in society, property ownership had to be fairly widespread. And, and the Louisiana Territory, the doubling of the size of the United States, at least in theory, would have enabled uh, the mass of uh, the United States population to become at least small landowners, and some of them larger ones. Now, the fact that we have a uh, program, as it turns out, of government largesse uh, accumulating in an unequal fashion in the hands of a relative few uh, should not come as a great shock to anybody as it worked out. And so you had the theory of the land going in a wide distribution to support the Democratic Republic and the reality of its gradual accumulation in relatively few hands and the carving out of great estates such as those that they knew back uh, east. Considering the new constitution was only in effect about 15 years by the time of the purchase, and for a lot of people, the fate of the republic was still in doubt. Many people believe that the acquisition of Louisiana actually cemented the republic for the United States. Isn't it ironic that the poet who actually destroys the French republic and the transfer of Louisiana to the United States actually saves, uh, certainly makes permanent the American republic? From what I've seen, Ralph, the acquisition of this large territory created uh, great problems. That is, problems for dividing. And actually, the British had plans to dismember the United States, and uh, the acquisition of Louisiana Purchase and other territory uh, certainly um, destabilized, destabilized uh, the United States. And they were still, the British were negotiating with people in Vermont, in New England, all the way to 1815. And um, actually, from the standpoint of uh, getting more territory, helping America, I think it would, would have been just the opposite at this point. So uh, if, if I may go back to the, the, what Jefferson's motivations, wasn't he beyond, not, not really thinking about all this new territory as much as thinking about getting right of deposit at New Orleans to right. save the interior of, of, the, of the Mississippi Valley, which would have been his primary. Let me follow up on that yeah. point about size. I mean, remember, too, that there was still, I think, a substantial body of opinion in the republic uh, as to whether or not a republic could exist in a vast geographic um, territory. I mean, that had been one of the arguments 
Sam Adams, I think, was one of those. Sam things. Adams, I mean, it was one of the arguments that people in Virginia, some people in Virginia made that led to the surrender of Virginia's claims to the Northwest Territory. Richard Henry Lee, in, in particular, was one. And Madison, of course, was the one who takes this novel idea of um, solving some of the political problems that the, he conceived the nation to have faced in 1787. Uh, the idea of the extended republic, that if you spread people out, it would be difficult for various factions to coalesce and to create some of the kinds of problems that he thought existed in 1787. So I think at the time of the purchase, that question of does size matter was still very much up in the air for uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, we tend to read back perhaps in seeing this as um, seamless when it, when it was anything but. And, and, and maybe we also uh, concentrate a little bit more on the kind of political, mm -hmm. ideological aspect of it, and we forget that that territory actually represented economic opportunity for many, many individuals. So that was land now controlled by the United States, which could be sold or parceled out you know, to individuals. So there was a tremendous economic aspect to the land transfer, you know, not just but not just political. Let's talk about the geography of it. Uh, Merrill, can you tell us how much was known, uh, was not known actually about this vast territory to the average American who, of course, lived east of the mountains? Well, the average person in the U.S. had no idea what lay to the west of the Mississippi River, other than there were plains and there were mountains in some place. Uh, Jefferson actually spent some time trying to figure out what lay to the west. He studied all the uh, sources that he could find both in the U.S. and in France, and uh, as a result of uh, his many years of study, uh, he came up with what we might call a, a beautiful vision of a mythical geography <laughs> of, of the Far West. Uh, by the time of the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson still believed that the Far West was the home of great elephantine beasts like mastodons and, and um, he uh, still believed that uh, the highest mountains in the U.S. probably were the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Southern Appalachians. Uh, the Rocky Mountains were there. He knew that the Rockies were there, but he thought that they were uh, mountains very similar to the Appalachians, uh, uh, symmetrical to the Appalachians, could be crossed within a day, and they were probably about 150 miles to the uh, east of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Jefferson's view of the West included a vision of uh, uh, a huge mountain of salt that was 180 miles long, about 50 <laughs> miles wide. His vision of the West was a land where the soils were, were so fertile that uh, only grass could grow. He, he didn't really understand the meaning of uh, desiccation. Uh, he, uh, he had uh, uh, his, his biggest misunderstanding about the West was that uh, you could uh, cross the West uh, with a short portage and make it to the Pacific Ocean in very short order. And that's where Lewis and Clark really disappointed Jefferson when they returned because uh, uh, they, just, they, they told him that was pure fantasy. But then you have later the uh, explorers who actually went that far behind Lewis and Clark Pike and Long. Didn't they have similar disappointments about what they found in trying to go across the Rockies? Well, it wasn't just a matter of the Rockies. That, uh, Pike tried to find the source of the Mississippi River, and I believe he failed, so he went to the west, and he tried to climb a mountain, and he failed to do that as well, but he had the mountain named after him. Uh, he uh, uh, found his way into uh, Mexican-controlled territory, Spanish-controlled territory, and they escorted him back to the U.S. territory. Uh, Long uh, tried to find uh, the, the southern boundary, and, and uh, was uh, uh, unsuccessful there. The big thing that Pike and Long really cre contributed to our geogra geographical understanding of, uh, that, of, the, of the purchase was they are the ones who came up with this great American desert uh, uh, idea. Uh, they came back and told everybody most of the purchase is unfit for human settlement and that notion of the great American desert lasted uh, throughout most of the 19th century. It really wasn't until the Industrial Revolution uh, came along and provided the technology to go in and tame the Great American Desert that things changed, that image uh, uh, 
have changed. Uh, I might add, as a geographer, uh, western Kansas is not a desert. Uh, it's a steppe. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so these folks uh, had a little trouble with climate designations, but uh, they've created an, an aura about the, the western uh, Louisiana Purchase uh, that really, from a geographical standpoint, created a, a tale of two purchases, the eastern useful side and the western Great American Desert side. Now, Louisiana was one of Spain's last colonial acquisitions, and yet it really had not done very much to map out the area and explore it. Do you think that made it easier for the Americans to come in and to uh, input their own culture on this territory? Well, I mean, initially, I think there had been a fair amount of effort on the part of the Spaniards uh, at least to survey the areas that they attempted to claim and settle. The problem was, in part, the distances from the centers of Spanish government and authority, say in Mexico City or, you know, in terms of the southeast, Havana or Santo Domingo, um, the great amount of territory involved, much of which was populated by native groups that tended to be uh, very mobile, um, also to be hostile to the encroachment of outsiders on their territory. And so the nature of colonization in those areas uh, of what the Spanish referred to as northern New Spain, New Spain was their vice royalty that included Mexico, uh, proceeded in a very different fashion. Um, they tended to depend on missionary settlements um, and you know, relatively small garrisons of military people, and so there, there was a lot of open space. And they also were constantly dealing with Indian groups that were not under Spanish control and therefore, you might say, were available to form alliances with other European groups that might want to enter. New Orleans, particularly, and Louisiana in general, remains a very unique and desirable experience for people from the outside. And except for four of us who were born here, I'd like to talk, to, ask the rest of you, what keeps you here? What remains so desirable about Louisiana even today? Merrill? <laughs> I always tell my students I was actually born on the West Bank uh, in Kansas. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Uh, New Orleans has a, has a, a character all of its own, and uh, I, I discover that character every time I come up to an intersection and realize that a red light is only a statement of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think anybody who likes a city with that type of character, that sense of abandon, is going to uh, uh, want to stay in New Orleans, and uh, uh, there is no duplicate in the country. Thank God. I'd like to make a comment. I wasn't born here, but I've been here since uh, 30 years, actually, uh, this month. Um, in studying the cultural activities in New Orleans, particularly, uh, or being a journalist through the years here, um, something that struck me was that it's uh, New Orleans as America's cultural um, heart and soul. Um, but also as it's a reminder of what America could have been, especially its early history. Um, the, seeing the different groups coming together and enjoying each other's culture, keeping their separate identities, but easy mixing between the groups. And um, the, it's so different from the books I read. I read books about New Orleans, and it's an interesting place, but it's not the place I live. Mm -hmm. You go back to the original uh, diaries and letters and. Um, and the, you recognize that city that uh, it's not magic or accident or all that. Uh, it's not silly. Uh, and there's not a disregard for rules and regulations. There's a great regard for ritual um, that gives you a freedom to go out there because you know you can get back, which is a basis of improvisation, which is a basis of the city. Uh, it works. Uh, red lights were probably created in Cleveland, but we know that if there's nobody there, why not go? Uh, it's another rule. It's not a disregard for rule. It's saying that we need to challenge these notions, these dualities, and these, uh, uh, yes, sacred and secular. You know, the, the yes, um, uh, family man and rebel. 
Uh, and those, uh, that duality of New Orleans, uh, I think, is very intriguing, and it, it reminds me of what, what America could have been and might still be. So I feel like I'm participating in this experiment. And you become a New Orleanian. Uh, I'll never, you know. Yes, you will. My, my grandmother does not make rude. You know, so it, I'm, a, I'm an um, a observer and a, a lot of my, you don't make <laughs> An admirer and a participant. I hope all of you had the same experience that I had this during the last hour and a half talking about the purchase of the trains for wondering and probably going back to what it must have been like when they signed the documents. Having no sense, I suspect, as to what would happen over the next few hundred years. I had a sense of history that I was also a part of here, part of this movement that came bringing the United States to Louisiana, but at the same time helping to transform the United States into something more than just angle of pulse across that mighty coast. To learn more about the Louisiana Purchase and the rich history of Louisiana, visit the Louisiana State Museum's Cabildo, located on historic Jackson Square in the heart of the New Orleans French Quarter. <laughs>